diversity produce unity? Okay? Does diversity produce unity? It's been 200 years since William Miller quietly became convinced from Scripture that Jesus Christ would soon return to earth. And I think it would be understandable if Adventists today said, what happened there? There's no soon about it. So we have 30% of North American members attend Sabbath schools. 50% of North American members attend church. 50% of North American members attend church. Listen to the next one. 16 to 26 percent of North American members return tithe or give offerings. 16 to 26 percent. 50 percent of Adventist schools in North America have closed in the past 20 years. 50 percent of Adventist schools have closed in the last 20 years. So, yes, could this be because we have lost our identity, our reason for existence, our purpose, our mission, the mission of the remnant church? Um, instead, we have become, in many ways, one more gray church in a sea of evangelical gray churches today. Major disconnects, contradictions, seen in a recent review that I'm going to share some things from this afternoon, an Adventist review. There's a real danger in this article, there's a real danger that pursuing sanctification itself as a goal may get off track and become individualistic, even narcissistic. The New Testament never defines spirituality or sanctification in individualistic terms. It is defined in terms of community. The goal of sanctification is to be more loving, gracious, caring, and generous. Jesus must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything. At his coming, he will complete the restoration of relationships, my personal relationship with God, and our relationships with one another. All right, let's read the text and then let's analyze that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Sanctification, does that sound like it's individual or community? That's dead on individual, isn't it? To possess your vessel, you and you and you and me. To possess our vessels in purity and mentioning about abstaining from fornication. How can sanctification possibly refer to the church as a whole unless it focuses on the individuals in the church. To say that it is community, not individual, is just wrong. If justification is personal, and we all agree that it's personal, forgive me for my sins, if justification is personal, how can sanctification be anything but personal? Also, Jesus remains in heaven until the time comes that he wants to come back and restore everything. We are irrelevant to that time. He's going to come when he decides he wants to come. And then, notice, only then will he, not us, he complete our relationship with God. And that relationship will not be completed in the latter rain or in the sealing time. Sanctification is always incomplete, according to this article, as long as we live. And so, we'll just wait it out. That's what this article was saying. Now, having said that, sanctification is a community. It's not individualistic. It won't be completed until he decides to complete it. The next article, the very next article, listen to that. One specific aspect of sanctification it dealt with. An unhealthy lifestyle, that's about sanctification. 
An unhealthy lifestyle can prevent us from enjoying the most meaningful relationships, especially our partnership with Christ. Remember, he completes that relationship at his second coming. No, this says an unhealthy lifestyle will prevent us from relationships, especially with Christ. Sleep deprivation, unmanaged stress, the use of unhealthy substances can affect our memory and depreciate the quality of both our service to God and our relationships with others. In the same way, unhealthy food choices may impact our physical and mental health and limit our useful service to God. So as we prepare for the coming of Jesus, diet does matter. Whatever produces physical health promotes the development of a strong mind and a well-balanced character. For example, scientific data shows an increased risk of heart disease, high blood pressure, some cancers, obesity, and diabetes from the consumption of meat. Hundreds of research papers show the value of a regular use of fruit and vegetables, whole grains, beans, nuts, and seeds to significantly lower the incidence of those chronic diseases. No wonder that among those who are waiting for Jesus' return, meat eating will cease to form a part of their diet. You know what we just read? Diet and lifestyle, part of sanctification, individual sanctification, affects our relationship with God and with others. So it really does matter about our lifestyle. The previous article degrades or, or destroys individual sanctification. This article promotes individual sanctification on one specific issue. You see the, the disconnect we're getting and contradictions in just one article right next to each other. The next article, the very next article, deals with the subject of perfection. Listen up. In my late teens, I tried to convince other people of the possibility and need to live a perfect, sinless life. Since Jesus calls us to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, the case seemed obvious to me. Scripture defi describes holiness as a prerequisite to see the Lord. When I was younger, the word perfect in Matthew 5.48 immediately seemed to indicate sinlessness. It took me years to comprehend the context of Jesus' statement. His call to be perfect, as our Heavenly Father is perfect, comes at the conclusion of his discourse about love for one's enemies. Luke renders that injunction, be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Jesus therefore defines perfection as unselfish, other-centered love. So it isn't about being perfect. It isn't about being holy. It's about being kind, being generous, being thoughtful, and being loving. And this reasoning has been used for the last 50 years in the Seventh-day Adventist Church as a, to destroy any motivation that we might have to really become holy in the sight of God. Here's a question I ask. Was Jesus the most loving person that ever lived? Was he not also the most obedient person that history has ever seen? Those two are one and the same thing. Love and obedience cannot be separated. At least that's how I see it. Then this amazing statement, same article. This insight has led me to a shocking realization. My keeping of God's law and striving to overcome sin is sinful if I am concerned primarily with my right and wrong doing. Wow. Overcoming sin, if I want to do the right thing, is sinful. What an ultimate oxymoron that we just read right there. A desperate attempt, a desperate attempt to discourage any attempt to become holy. Continuing. A behavior-oriented Christianity suggests that the fight against sin is the primary battle of a Christian. Ellen White noted, nevertheless, that the greatest battle we have to fight is to surrender our will to God. Okay. Surrendering the will means giving up what? Sin. That's right. How can you surrender your will if you say, I want that sin in my life? Surrendering the will and giving up sin and selfishness are descriptions of the same thing. And yet here, no, it's, it's, uh, we've misunderstood passages like that. Same article. True assurance, therefore, cannot come from placing our trust in the growth of our character. Justification by the merits of Christ is the only essential and objective ground for our assurance, something that we accept through faith. 
Well, you just read in one sentence the evangelical gospel right there. Justification is what matters. It's the only thing necessary for salvation. Sanctification is nice, but it is not necessary for salvation. It's nice to have around. And this has been taught for 50 years in the Seventh-day Adventist Church by people like, and I will name them today, Desmond Ford, Jack Sequera, George Knight, Morris Venden, and the 12 seminary professors of last year's books. 50 years in the Adventist Church. What an amazing denigration of sinless living in the sight of a holy God in all of these things. Reducing it to helping those in need, being a nice person. What a desperate attempt to twist and destroy clear teachings of the Bible and Ellen White's writings about living without sinning in the sight of God. It's been going on for a long, long time. Ellen White said Christ, and this is the same article, Ellen White said Christ will come when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people. This statement concludes a chapter that portrays Christ as helping those in need and sharing the gospel with everyone, activities she viewed as manifestations of Christ's character of unselfish love, thus understanding that oft-quoted statement as a reference to mere sinless perfection hardly does justice to the true breadth of its inclinations. How about that? A description of living without sinning as mere sinless perfection, reducing it to helping those in need. And then we have achieved the, the, the purpose for which God put us here. And that's it. These statements which are clear, precise, both biblical and spirit of prophecy statements have been twisted to make it correspond with what we think is possible for us. We're pretty critical, aren't we, of scholars twisting the words of Scripture to turn Sabbath observance into Sunday observance. Same words of Scripture. We're doing exactly the same thing today to clear statements about holy living and overcoming all temptations to sin. Yet a few pages later, okay, same review, a few pages later, another article. Consider Jesus' words. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus is not speaking of giving up certain selfish benefits, but of rejecting all links with our selfish nature. This total repudiation is how we begin to follow Jesus. The condition of discipleship is therefore the breaking of every link which ties a person to self. Evidently, denying oneself as Jesus requires means living without a self-centered thought with the mind devoted to Jesus and his work exclusively. How about that? Isn't living without a self-centered thought, as we just read, the same as living without sinning? How can you live without one self-centered thought and not be living without sinning at the same time. Because that's what sin is, self-centered ideas and thoughts. I want this. Don't take that away from me. That's what sinning is. Is there any wonder why our people, our good Seventh-day Adventist people, are confused when they read one article, and then the very next article says the opposite thing, and the next article, and then the next article says the opposite thing? That's the confusion that's happening in my beloved church right now and in our papers. All right, let's look up another text. John chapter 17. This, you remember, is Jesus' last prayer with his disciples and really for us as well. John 17, verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. There is Jesus' classic prayer. Let's be one. Let's let the world see that we are one with each other and one with God. So... Next article. 
God has made many members in the body of Christ, and in those members, he said, there is diversity. God has put conservatives in the church. God has put liberals in the church. God has put people in the middle in the church. God has set the members of the body as it has pleased him. We need the diversity in the church to carry on and fulfill the mission of the church. In a time that we are so divided, we can't agree on women's ordination. Have you noticed? We can't agree on the appropriate music to use in church today. We can't agree on what teachings are necessary before a person gets baptized. We can't agree on whether or not we will ever be living without sinning after the close of probation. We can't agree on that one either. We can't agree on whether justification or sanctification is the most important part of salvation. Can't agree. We are being told that God wants it this way. That's what we just read. God likes that. We need diversity. God has put conservatives in the church and he wants you to stay that way. God has put liberals in the church and he wants you to stay that way. It's all good and for his glory. Do you really think that we need to be continually debating and arguing with each other as liberals or conservatives or middle of the road or whatever else it is? Is this being one as God and the Father are one or as God and us need to be one? Strange, strange ideas coming. And I'm going to give you a specific example uh, how this works out, this unity and diversity idea, in one very divisive issue in the church today. This was in Ministry Magazine. A friend of mine challenged me to write about how the church can minister to persons with same-sex attraction in a healthy way. The ideas expressed in this article would apply to heterosexuals, homosexuals, and bisexuals. All right? So you have the picture of what the issue is and what is going to be talked about. <clears throat> Can a person who has sexual urges and attractions that differ from the biblical model be a member of the church? For those who are sexually active outside of biblical marriage, the answer is no. So, if we do not allow such persons to hold, to hold formal membership in the church organization, how do we minister to them? An illustration of how this might look is the Little Flowers community in Winnipeg, Canada. According to this paradigm, Jesus accepts persons the moment the seed of faith is planted in their heart, even though that seed has not yet borne the fruit of correct behavior. What did you just hear right there? This whole plan that we're going to read about is based on the idea of who is accepted by Christ and saved at what point. Okay? So for this church community, people become part of the group by accepting Jesus and a willingness to grow. It may be fruitful to explore whether there is light in creating a space for certain people groups that do not seem to currently have a place in the organizational structure. In these situations, a home might be created for them without official membership in the denomination, where they could belong to a community that seeks Jesus. The hope would be that the day would come when their growth in Christian lifestyle would allow official membership in the organization. We must find ways to include those whose sexual lifestyle is outside the teaching of Scripture. Okay, what did we just read here? For people who are not willing to surrender their life practices to God's will as specified in Scripture, should we create a special section of the church where they can belong? Remember, they're already saved. That's the key point. The evangelical gospel, they're saved. They believe in Jesus. They just aren't living a great sanctified life right now and don't want to change. But they're saved because they believe in Jesus with the hope but they will eventually change their life practices someday. But they're saved. And so we need a special part of the church set aside for them where they can feel part. And by the way, if they're already saved, what's the real incentive to change? If they're already saved, why should I change? It's all okay. 
This is the real practical outcome of unity and diversity teachings right now. That everything, all viewpoints are equally valid. And therefore, we must feel free to express them all in the ways that we are impressed God wants us to do it. A letter came in response to this article. It seems appropriate that the, that the LGB plus person should be related to the church as the church relates to a smoker, a drug addict, or alcoholic. They should be loved, accepted, and given all the support we can give them, while at the same time encouraging them to take advantage of a support group so they can be helped to understand the true nature of their habit and its sinful reality, and the fact that the Holy Spirit cannot dwell in a temple that is willfully contaminated by sin or sinful practices. <coughs> Certainly, any LGB plus person who desires help deserves our earnest prayers and friendly and loving support as they battle with their inclinations and practices as we do with any person who is struggling with any practice that heaven will not condone or admit. Very sound letter, I thought. In total contradiction to the article that went before it. One way or the other is the right way. They can't be both right. Another article in ministry, Celebration of Diversity. We vary greatly in the way we worship. There are contemporary services, traditional services, and blended services. But all the churches are striving to provide a space for worshipers to have an authentic experience with God. We also differ from one another with regard to our individual practices. Practices vary all the way from enjoying sugars and fats to eliminating both from exercising daily to not exercising at all, and from eating meat to raw veganism. Some oppose what they consider the lavish purchasing of houses and cars while having a preference for jewelry and ornaments. I have seen many differences in practice when it comes to baptism, the age of the baptismal candidate, what the candidate needs to believe prior to baptism, how much pre-instruction the candidate should receive, and how long the candidate needs to attend church before getting baptized. These are all dealt with differently throughout the global church. There are several different views about the nature of Christ. The majority of believers hold that God is the creator, but the church has allowed for diversity in thought concerning the length of time that life has been on the earth. In spite of all these differences in lifestyle, practice, and theology, the church still believes in unity and may have even become more effective in its mission because of this diversity. Nothing is gained and no one grows when there is no diversity. The last church I pastored had many different kinds of people. Despite our differences, we were united into one community. We worshiped diversely. One week our service would be very traditional, the next it would be quite contemporary. Even theologically, we were diverse. We differed in how we viewed the nature of Christ, the sanctuary in heaven. Through this diver unity in diversity, we were not only able to become closer as a church family, but also to reach out effectively to a greater number of people. As the result of tapping into our diversity, the church approached the completeness Paul wrote about in Galatians 3.28, we are all one in Christ Jesus. And then they even quoted this statement from Ellen White, as there are divisions everywhere in society, the Lord Jesus would have the unity of his workers appear in marked contrast to the divisions. In unity there is strength, in division there is weakness. They actually quoted that at the end of the article saying diversity is a great thing. We've got to have it. We can be more effective witnesses. And then they quoted a statement that divisions that causes weakness. Strange, strange things are happening in this area. And the concluding statement, by the way, the reference for that in case you wanted to look it up is a letter, probably hard to get at, letter 31, 1892. The article concluded with, diversity is worth celebrating. So, is diversity in lifestyle, I'm not talking about culture, I'm not talking about background. Is diversity in theology and lifestyle a healthy thing for the church of Jesus Christ? No. Let's go back to John. John 17, same chapter. Hmm. 
John 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. True unity, my friends, can only be based on truth if there is a God in heaven. Truth is not many shades of gray and certainly not opposite poles of right and wrong. A hallmark of the Seventh-day Adventist Church has been unity based on Scripture, not on preferences, not on culture, and it is this Bible-based unity that makes this church the only truly worldwide Protestant church. Because other Protestant churches are separated into divisions and national churches. We are the only truly worldwide Protestant church and it is being threatened right now. Diversity of belief about what the scriptures teach does not bring about unity, my friends, but fragmentation. Each in a little click, talking about what they want to talk about. And this is exactly what is happening. Let's look up one more text. Mark chapter 3, verse 25. And if a house, were Jesus' words, and if a house be divided against itself, the house cannot stand. Those are Jesus' specific words about diversity in unity, causing unity. Then Ellen White adds in Gospel Workers, page 391, men would effect a union through conformity to popular opinions, through a compromise with the world. But truth is God's basis for the unity of his people. There it is. Same thing Jesus said, same thing Ellen White is saying. Can we really purchase unity at the cost of truth? The issue is whether scripture or culture will guide this church into the future. It is scriptural tr truth that holds this movement together as a world church, not diversity. Varieties of interpreting scripture can only lead to splintering over many issues. And I'll conclude this little topic with Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. This couldn't be clearer. Ephesians 4, 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness. Some of what I just read to you were both those things. The slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. There is no unity in diversity, and it can never be. Be very, very careful as to what you hear and what you read.